These teams create integrated, secure infrastructures and exciting new innovations. At Cisco, we're helping learners unleash their potential and future-proof their career by skilling up in IT. Cisco Networking Academy has the courses, tools, resources and connections to help you jumpstart your career. We even have a job matching engine to help you start your career. Networking Academy offers career pathways across high demand technologies. 95% of students got a job or pursued further education by taking Cisco certification ready courses. If you have skills in these areas, thousands of employers around the world need you. Cybersecurity is a vital aspect of any business. This pathway focuses on the protection of computer systems and networks from unauthorized and criminal access. Networking is at the heart of every digital organization, and this pathway will give you foundational knowledge of how networks operate, how to configure, troubleshoot and secure them, and more. The possibilities are endless in programming. This pathway teaches you how to design code, to connect wireless devices, automate networks, or prevent a cyber attack. Here's how it works. Start by enrolling in one of our flexible online courses to get a feel for which path suits you best or to upskill in an area of interest. Or find an instructor-led class near you. Our flexible learning options make it easy to choose the right learning style for you. Cisco Networking Academy courses help you gain the knowledge, practice skills and earn digital badges and certifications on the pathway to the career you want. Connect to jobs with over 650 employer partners through our job matching engine. Choose who you want to work with. Afterwards, stay connected on Networking Academy's alumni network on LinkedIn. Our student success speaks for itself. My advice to anyone interested in pursuing a career in networking or IT is to be resilient and know that your habits really do determine your success. There will be times in which you fail. You might read something and not initially understand it or completely fail a certification exam. That is a part of the process that lets you know what you need to work on. During times of my failure, I made sure to reach out to anyone that I could, anyone and everyone that could give me advice, share knowledge with me that could reteach a concept to me that I didn't understand and practice, practice, practice. If I can do it, you can do it too. Find your future today. I'm the founder and CEO of Skybound Rescuer, which is an organization that specializes in the use of drones for public safety. It's such a new industry that it didn't exist when I was at school, so it's not a career that I could have aspired towards. So how did I get here? If you have enough passion for something, then you are the right person to take it forward. When your dream career starts taking you to places that you've always dreamt of visiting, it's an incredible feeling. Hello, and welcome to the new series of our Women Rock IT program, which kicks off today and runs through until July 2022. October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and to kickstart the celebration, we have a fantastic panel of speakers today who will share how they've embraced their cybersecurity skills to join the fight against cybercrime. Whether you're a student, a veteran, or seeking a career change, the dynamic field of cybersecurity is rapidly growing and has something for everyone. Being part of the live audience today entitles you to free course enrollment into some really fun courses such as Introduction to Cybersecurity, the introduc Introduction to Internet of Things, Networking Essentials, Linux, Python, and Entrepreneurship. Details relating to course enrollment will be posted during today's event. In the interest of time, we will take any questions you have for our amazing speakers directly after this session. If you're joining us over social media, you can post your questions in the chat bot 
or tweet your question to hashtag WomenRockIT. Thanks, and let's get started. I would love to introduce today's guest speakers. I'm really excited to have both of them here. Jenny Radcliffe, the people hacker, is a world-renowned social engineer, interesting title, hired to bypass security systems through a no-tech mixture of psychology, con artistry, cunning, and guile. And she'll be followed by Burju, a Cisco Networking Academy alumnus, I'm so happy to say, who is now a cybersecurity leader here at Cisco. But first, we will hear from Jenny, who is joining us today from the UK. Welcome, Jenny, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Let me just share this screen. And we can get started. Thank you so much for having me on this brilliant program. I'm so happy to be here. Um, as you said before, oops, just let me get to that. Uh, my title is The People Hacker, uh, and I'm gonna touch a little bit about what that means and what my job is, and really how it's sort of, I work adjacent to tech. Um, and then just some advice that I've learned from running my own business and brand over all this time. So thank you so much for introducing me, Rebecca. So uh, as you can see, uh, I'm known as the people hacker. It was a title a journalist gave me when she interviewed me several years ago, and I thought it was great, so I stole it. <laughs> and my specialisms include three things, really, well, four. So the first thing is, is that I'm a specialist in physical infiltration, and that is really, the shorthand is burglary, but only for hire. So I don't do this for fun, I do it for clients who ask me to uh, break into their buildings, uh, attack their sort of security systems, without tech. So can I get past the people? Can I get past the gates, guards, um, and so on? I'm also a specialist in psychological manipulation, and that's because we also have to replicate scams and cons and fraud um, in order, again, to educate and to train. And that makes me um, pretty much a con artist. And that's the title that I give globally when people ask me what to do, although it's hard to explain without people thinking I'm a terrible person. But con artist is a good title because it, it encompasses everything that I do. And as I say, I guess the biggest job is that I'm an educator. And so the, the point of my, my sort of career is to do all these things, to show the art of the possible and then to train people in how to avoid being um, conned by the bad guys or gals who are doing the same thing. So why is this so important? You will probably know people hacking better by the term social engineering. Um, and my definition of social engineering looks like this. Familiar to most, it's the manipulation of human factors to gain unauthorized access to resources and assets for criminal gain or malicious intentions in the real world. So not when I'm replicating this. But I'm going to go further and say what social engineers really do is actively weaponize human vulnerability. And because it's being actively weaponized, we really need to actively prevent against it and, and, and in the defense space. So that's really what I do. Um, and the reason this is so important is that most security breaches, and I've, I've thrown a, a title, um, a, a statistic here that says 95% of security breaches, but it sort of depends on, uh, you know, which study you look at, but it's never less than 75, 80% are down to human error or manipulation. And that makes what I do very important because any amount of cybersecurity measures, any amount of technical measures come to naught if the humans are subject to error and manipulation. It means that every time you get a smishing text, so someone trying to activate you through a text message, whether you're phishing emails that we're all bombarded with and some of them still get through despite the tech, whether it's a uh, an old fashioned phone call, whether it's physical infiltration of a building, and I'll tell you some more about that in a second. But most security alerts come down to the humans, whether it's stealing your credentials, logging into your systems, or looking at the things that we all are entitled to keep private. It is the people that are seen in security as the weakest link. And I hate this term because we are not the weakest link but it's easy for people to understand and it is proliferated throughout our industry press. 
who, um, if we're not careful, see the users, so people who are not in security, as sheep, as people who just follow whatever they're led to do. And I'm just going to click through some of these headlines. Weakest link in the chain, humans are the weakest link, security's weakest link. It's just such a common term. And I don't want you to think of yourselves like that. The humans are something that we can work with. Now, it doesn't matter what size business you're in. It can be a large business. It can be a medium-sized business. It can be individuals. We're all targets for these people. And so that really um, is where I work and what we try and do. I try and inform you so that you're not a target uh, for the social engineers that are out there. But most businesses still leave this critical part of security unaddressed. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about how I got into it, but I'll give you just, I'll run you through a typical job. I would probably be in a large uh, corporate office being asked to infiltrate. I would not go through the front entrance because that's always very well guarded. I'd be looking to go somewhere like a staff entrance, which would be less well guarded. I might hang out with staff somewhere around the building, maybe put on a high visibility jacket so people think that I'm supposed to be there, carry a clipboard and almost anyone will let me through. And I look innocent enough. Um, they'll let me through. I would take the stairs rather than the elevator, go into an office, maybe avoid security cameras, maybe stick blue tack over them, pick up keys, um, drop some USBs around uh, with malware on them or with at least trackers because obviously we're not uh, malicious. Look for any kind of security problems that there might be and people still do write their passwords down on post-it notes but are often not quite as obvious as that. I usually make myself a cup of tea, get into the office, leave some business cards all around the office and then leave them an email, get out again and go and sit on the roof. And that's really my job. And my job is to do that in, um, for any client that hires me. Now, this is a view of some offices I've, I've looked at. This is Canary Wharf in London. I've been at the top of most of these buildings, been on the roofs of many of them. But the first skyline I saw was at home, which was in Liverpool. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how I got into this, because it's a question I'm always asked. So I grew up in Liverpool. Um, it's only famous for the Beatles and the soccer um, at the time I grew up, it was a pretty run-down city. I was attacked uh, in an alleyway when I was uh, really little. I was about eight years old, and I managed to fight my way out. And then I was kidnapped um, by a neighbour, and I managed to get out of that as well. And after that, my family put me with my cousins, who were older boys, to uh, teach me to be streetwise. And these are actual photographs of where I lived at the time I grew up. And what my parents didn't know is that my cousins were actually uh, up to no good. And so what they did is they taught me to get into buildings and to do something called urban exploration. So we'd look around the buildings. We wouldn't take anything or break anything, but it was learning what was inside these abandoned buildings and how to get in and out when we weren't meant to be there. And I did this for a, a long time. You get very good at it uh, if, you, if you do it when you're very young. And I learned things like the routine of a building, the way people behave, the way security guards behave, how to get in and out through locks and, and alarm systems and that type of thing. And Liverpool has loads of these buildings still abandoned now. So that's really what I did. And then by the time I got a little bit older, I was running cons all over the city. So uh, they taught me things like, so soda machines, you know, these vending machines, how to punch in certain co codes so that they'd vomit their change. And apologies to any soda um, or, you know, uh, vending machine companies. I do actually, I've done a lot and made up for it since then, to you specifically. I also delivered packages all over the city. No idea what was in them, but probably nothing good. Um, and I used to do things like sell tickets for events that weren't happening be first and when I first did it I thought the event actually did happen and I'd sell all these tickets and then people would turn up um, and not only was there not a VIP event um, but there'd be all these angry people um, that I'd sell tickets to a non-existent event but I didn't want to stay that way I didn't want to go the criminal route and as I say I've made up for it since and eventually in my city uh, we're famous for the football as I said and the only people with money were the, were the soccer players and we started to do security checks on their houses because they'd heard that we could get into these buildings. Could we get past their alarms that made them vulnerable to burglaries for real? 
So we started to do these sort of security assessments on all the big houses that the soccer players had in my city. And because I was a woman and I was um, able to write the reports, I ended up doing the kind of customer facing roles as well as breaking into all these big mansions on the outskirts of the city. And that's really how it all started. Um, once we got into their houses, they asked us to get into their businesses and then bigger businesses and other associates. And basically word of mouth spread until I'd broken into most of the offices in Liverpool, either talking my way in or getting over the roofs and things um, in order to protect them. And word spread and I ended up going all over the UK and then all over Europe and then to the States and literally talking my way into offices, past receptionists, um, sometimes I'd say I was there to measure something. So, yeah, I'm here to measure the drapes or the carpets of your new conference room. And because I looked as if I couldn't hurt anyone, because I wasn't a huge, you know, guy covered in tattoos and full of muscles, people let me through. And, um, and then what we'd do is we'd find any security problems, present it back to the client afterwards, um, and they protect themselves. I mean, sometimes I pretended I needed first aid or I was lost. Uh, maybe I, you know, we, we dumpster dive and go through all the documents in the bins. I pretend to deliver things sometimes. We put uh, listening devices or nothing in the box. It was just a way of me getting round. And I pose as the cleaners, the janitors, the maintenance staff, all to get to the target. So that's really the physical side of what I do. I'm just going to put this slide up just because I know that this will be available on demand and it's useful for people. But the stages of attack that we have look like this. So we'd, from a psychological point of view, once the target was identified, we research and map them out and, and work out, you know, the best relationship, what would work culturally as an approach. And we make contact. And then, as you can see, we'd attack, we'd acquire and we do whatever we were asked to do. And this used to be a difficult thing for me to do. I used to have to go and wait outside offices and things to see what the routines were, to work out relationships, to see what their attitude to hierarchy and authority was, to see whether those employees like the high-vis jacket would work. But nowadays I don't have to do that. My job is so much easier because of social media. So because people put everything, everything about themselves, on social media when I was younger and I had to I had to research a, a, a company as I say I used to do physically a lot of the time a lot of telephone work and it'd take me a really long time to get that intel you know days and days sometimes but now I can accomplish this in a matter of hours because people are not careful about what they put online um and one of the biggest lessons I give to people is you really need to watch what you're posting about yourself online we post Every time we take a run, every time we uh, enjoy a meal, we review the meal. We have our friends, we have our businesses. And all of these things make up this picture so that someone from an attack perspective can know the things that you care about, the people that you care about. We all have someone we wish to protect. We all have something that we're frightened of. And we put it out there online. And Zuckerberg said it. He said, this isn't the tech's fault. The question isn't what we want to know about people, but it's what people want to tell us about themselves. And when I first saw the proliferation of social media and the way people interacted with it, it was horrific really to me because I could see the potential of what we can do with what people post. So really my business and its job is to warn people about how that can be weaponized. Because in my hands and in the hands of someone with mal intent, it, it's it's potentially lethal. And what we do with that information, data is no good without a story. So we create the story through psychology. So I'll now be looking at like things like how can I manipulate emotion in order to make that person do what we want them to do? And remember, again, we stop short of harm. It's for a training purposes. So emotions, you know, I showed you the picture of the sheet before, but what we have to understand is that an attacker does see the humans, the users, as vulnerable as the weakest link is sheep and will pull us along with the things that make us human, the cognitive biases, the emotions, the psychological levers. So whether it's because we are bored and we're not really paying attention, we're not really sharp enough. And this was something that was very true during lockdown, for example. We don't pay a lot of attention when we get fed up.
whether it's because we suspect the wrong people, because people always think that a hacker looks like this and a hacker can look like this, um, or whether it's just curiosity so that you are going to plug in the USB. All of these things, the things that make us human, the fact that we get distracted, the fact that security isn't even in our job title, so therefore it's not our problem. These are the things that make us vulnerable as humans. Whether it's ransomware that scares us into clicking on a link, whether it's someone offering us a job or a free gift or a discount so that we open that attachment or go to that bad site, whether it's um, saying that they've got hold of our files or that they're going to blackmail us or extort us into, you know, some fabricated photographs or anything else. All of these things, all of these emotions tap into the wrong side of our brain, our fast thinking, mammalian, emotional brain that stops us bringing logic to the party and helps the bad guys and gals get to us. And that's really why the security breaches are down to human error. It's because we're human and it's our strength, but it's also a weakness. So what I've always said in terms of the business is people ask me if I pick locks and, and things and I can and, and, and sometimes we have to, but mostly I don't because I don't need to work on the lock. I need to work on the humans. But what I want to say to you today, this audience, is that what it really should say is that I don't need to work on the lock. I need to work with the humans. And from a security point of view, that's what we have to do. We really need to work with them to stop them becoming victims. And that's really my mission and that's my job and that's my, what my whole life is, is down to. So, look, I wanted to say fr from that point of view, I've built this sort of business over, over a long time, 25 years really, um, but a whole lifetime of doing my job. And I have a few things... Um, Cisco asked me to give a few pieces of advice. What did I find useful? So here we go with some advice. The first thing is, is that it takes hard work to get to the top of anything and we can't be lazy. And it's hard because sometimes we feel like um, things come easily these days with social media and everything else. So what I would say is you've got to be prepared to do the work and to do that, do it early, be productive early. OK, because if you can get as much done as possible at the early part of the day, and I know some people will say, I'm a night owl, do it early. The world doesn't know you anything. And if you're up early and try and get things done, I've personally found that that works uh, quite well. I've also written here, stop whining, woman up and get on with it, which is a bit harsh. Um, the second thing I would say is that perfect is the enemy of good. And by which I mean, if you wait for the right time to get moving on things, you'll never get it done. It just is excuses. It's OK to make mistakes. It's OK to learn from them. But if you wait for the perfect circumstances, you won't even get started. No one's going to read your bad reviews except you. So just get going. The next thing is, is that you are the best person in the world at being you. So you have to kind of think of yourself, I've come to realise, as your brand. And, and that means that you cannot be a poor imitation of someone else. So you have to be careful about plagiarism and you have to be careful about uh, being performative, okay? Um, decide who you are and what you stand for and what your business stands for and have integrity around that. And what, what I mean by not being performative is if you believe in something, if you really believe in something, then you will work on that thing that you believe in and you will always be uh, truthful to that even if no one ever sees that you've done that good work. For me, if you're going to do good work, that good work has to be done as much in the shadows as it does in the spotlight. That is your brand and that integrity shines through even if people can't put a label on exactly why it's there. That's integrity, not attention. I also want to say to you um, that you can't drive very far on an empty tank. Um, and I, you know, goodness knows... I, I know what it's like to be a workaholic. I have a tendency to work very hard and forget to look after myself. One day, I found myself all of a sudden lying on the floor of my office um, and not being able to get up again. Um, and it was partly exhaustion, partly mental and psychological exhaustion, as well as physical exhaustion. It's very tempting to just keep going until you fall over. What I'd say that I've learned, and I don't mean to sound patronising or like, you know, your, your big sister or auntie, but 
You have to do all the things that are boring that you know. You have to eat well, not junk. You can't drink too much alcohol, and especially when you're busy and you're working, drink no, no alcohol because it just slows you down and slows down your thinking. Um, you need to get sleep and some exercise and you need to be kind to yourself and exercise any demons you have, address those things that nag you and that you know deep down hold you back. Otherwise, you can't drive on that empty tank. Um, it's just so true. The other thing I would say that's helped me massively, and I'm just sort of throwing advice out here, but is to find a team. And when I say this, I don't necessarily mean professionally. Um, I have people around me who tell me quickly and kindly and rationally to my face if I talk rubbish. And I don't always want to hear it and it's hard to hear, but I'm, I'm responsible for people and clients and important things. And I need people to be frank with me and I need to learn to listen and it's hard to hear. Find those people who will be with you as much as if you were a complete wreck and had done everything wrong, uh, as if you were receiving an Oscar or a knighthood. They are the people that will tell you you're great when you achieve something and will stop you catastrophizing when things go wrong. And they're also the people that make you laugh and you feel down. Um, and my biggest advice for you on this is you should be that person for someone else as well. Um, we all need it. They exist. And don't you dare, and this is particularly to the women out there, don't you dare lower your expectations about whether there are people out there who will support that, whether there are men and allies out there who will support that. If you are driven, you can find those people who will give you these things. And the last kind of piece of advice that I'm going to give you is about the shiny. Now, the shiny is sort of the name that I gave to success. Because I've been fortunate in my career, I've had some privilege and I've worked very hard and sometimes the stars have aligned and I've got some success. And success makes you shiny and people see the shiny, okay? But what you need to understand is people sometimes want that shiny to rub off on them without them working for it. And they want that to rub off at the expense of you. So what you have to do is you have to understand that success is very magnetic and you have to look after that and be generous with your success and be generous to other people, but also be wary of those that would take that from you without working hard for it. So just guards up sometimes. Now, I've said all these things as if I never have a bad day. And there are times I have a very bad day and I want to give up. In fact, there's times I want to sell um, carpets for a living and move a long way away from security and everything that that means. And on those days, this is what I tell myself. <laughs> And, you know, it's cheesy, but this is what I tell myself. I say, do sharks complain about Mondays? No. Sharks are up early, biting stuff, chasing stuff, being scary. On those days, remind everyone that you're a shark. Thank you so much for listening to me. I appreciate it. I'm going to hand you back now, if I can just come out of here, and I'm going to hand you back to the team. Wow, Jenny, thanks so much um, for sharing this amazing, intriguing career story with us and for alerting us to all the challenges out there. And the advice is something we all need to hear from time to time. So thank you. We will hold questions for Jenny until the end of the session. And now I'd like to follow on and introduce Burju Ishita, a former student of our Cisco Networking Academy, who's now a cybersecurity leader here at Cisco. So Burju, I'm going to turn it over to you to follow up, and we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, wow, Jenny, this was such an amazing presentation. I even forget who I was, what I was planning to talk about. This was amazing. So inspiring. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, so this is Burjo. Uh, I'm a cybersecurity systems engineering leader in Cisco. Uh, and today I will be talking about how did I come to this place? What's my story? What are my advices for you? But before I start, I want to give you a very basic, basic overview of what a systems engineer is. So I'm working with a group of superstar engineering team. And our role is to help our customers to select and design the best cybersecurity infrastructure for their um, journeys, what they are planning to achieve in their businesses. So my team around the globe is doing this for our customers. Um, so today, uh, first, I want to check with, in the next slide, a couple of questions with you. And I want to make sure that cybersecurity is a career for you, because 
it's my passion, definitely Jenny's passion, but it's not something for everyone. It's like a, either love it or hate it. And I want everybody to try in their careers. So let me first check a couple of questions with you. So just pause for a second. Think about it. Do you like learning new stuff every day? Like new technical developments, what's going on in the industry, what's happening around you? And what about thinking about yourself in like 10 years, 20 years? Do you like to do the same thing again and again? Or do you want a super variety in your career? Do this, jump to that, try another thing. Are your answers yes? The most important thing is, would you like your job to have an impact, a meaning, and an impact for your family, for your friends, even the world? And if this sounds very bold for you, just take a look to this article from last year from New York Times. It's about a woman who was classified as dead due to a cybersecurity threat for the first time. We know that was happening, but this is the first time it was classified. And it's because the person was needing an emergency response. And in Germany, they took it, took her to a hospital, but the hospital was suffering with a heart, um, cybersecurity attack and they couldn't accept this patient. And they need to transfer it to another department, another hospital. And during this time, during this transfer, we lost her. So you even have an impact on human life in this career. It's not only finding the passwords, it's not only like breaking into accounts or something. It's not about the credit cards. It's about human life. So if those things sound a little bit interesting for you, if this is something you want to do, let's kick it off. First, I will tell you about my story. How did I get into this role? So moving to the next slide. Uh, I want to first give you some statistics just to get a little bit more appetite. At this point, you identified this is an interesting career journey for you. But what are the chances for me to get a job? We know the job market is a little bit hard at this point. But if it is cybersecurity, and I want to get your attention to the chart on the left-hand side. It's from ISC Square, one of the most respected cybersecurity institutions. Uh, and this is the reason I got this. A little bit outdated chart. It's from 2020. Anyone remembers what happened in 2020? It is the start of COVID. And this was a study that was published just before the COVID or just at the beginning of COVID. So at that time, we were projectioning like 3 million open jobs around cybersecurity, around the world. But after COVID happened, we had a huge speed up on the transition to digitization. So which means we need even more cybersecurity experts in all kinds of cybersecurity experts. We listened to Jenny, amazing Jenny, who was doing a totally different thing, not like coding, not like hands-on technical, but in cybersecurity, we have tons of different departments. And on the right-hand side, by the way, this is just its statistics around United States of America. It gives you a very brief overview of what kind of technical roles do we have? What are their breakdowns? How many people do we need in those roles? And you can also see what kind of cybersecurity certifications we have. What's the demand? What's the supply? You don't want to chase the certifications that has tons of surplus. Just an idea. So at this point, we identified this is something for you. We proved we definitely have tons of gap to help us, to help the industry, to help our families and friends and the world. So how will you start your journey? Let me take a step back and tell you about my journey, which is kind of regular, but at some points, maybe not. Um, so how I started this journey is, in this next slide, you will see an advertisement. This was kind of the starting point for me, but let me take a couple step backs and make a meaning out of it. So I studied electronics engineering in university, and I was sharing a house with two of my friends. They were studying social sciences. So I was a techie at the house. I need to take care of the computers. It's desktop. It was 2003, four, so it was early years. And we decided to take an internet connection at home. And it was a dial-up connection. If you are not sure what's a dial-up connection, just Google it. It's super slow. But we were so determined to share it between three computers. And I had no idea how to do it. I know it's possible, but I had no idea how to do it. 
So I called a friend from university. I said, hey, we are planning to do this. Can you please help us? He said, sure, I know how to do it. I even have some spare cables at home. I will bring it to you. Perfect. He came to our house. He set up everything. And then got. We tried to use it. It was working perfectly. And then during weekend, we decided to do some cleanup at the house. It stopped working. And we had no idea how to fix it. Okay, what's the problem? We called my friend again. He come again. He fixed it again. He got. And then a couple of days later, it happened again. So I said, okay, this is this is not a solution. I need to learn it by myself. I need to fix it. I cannot live with it. Um, and at that time, it was the last year of the university. And in electronics engineering, at the very last semester, you need to select an expertise area. Is it like biomedicals? Is it telecommunications? Is it coding? Whatever it is. And I had no idea. But I know that I need to learn networking. I know that I want to do something different, something meaningful, something kind of new shiny toy, not something very regular. So while working, working in the university, I saw this exact same advertisement in the university corridor. It was the advertisement of Cisco Networking Academy from 2005, four actually. And if you are familiar with Cisco, you can notice this is an old logo, my favorite logo from good old times. So it was saying this is learning networking academy. We are giving you a training for eight months. You will be expert on this and that. I called my family and I said, hey, I need money. <laughs> I want to attend to this session. Um, and I started to this course. It was amazing. They teach us everything possible like cabling, the details, the connections, and I was super excited about this. This was the best choice I had ever made in my student life, I would say. Um, and after graduating from this networking academy, which took like eight months back then, just after one week, I landed my first role. It was a small startup, which was dealing with networking plus cybersecurity. And cybersecurity means they were trying to build their own firewall. And it was kind of, uh, if you are familiar with Linux, it's like a IP tables kind of logic, hello this IP, deny this IP, that's it. So it was not a big thing, but it made my introduction to cybersecurity. And the next picture you will see represents me back in my first row. This beautiful lady, it's not me by the way, uh, who has a backpack, who is traveling around the country. This was me. They were giving me a firewall box, a hardware. I was putting it to my backpack. I was traveling around the country, going to the companies, trying to install it. Sometimes it was successful. Sometimes I was failing miserably and someone was helping me. <laughs> but let me tell you a couple of interesting stories. It was, as I said, 2005. Um, and most of the maintenance windows to install those firewalls are during midnight because you cannot interrupt the services, etc. Um, I remember I was on the 20th floor of a company where IT department was located. We were trying to install the firewall, lots of problems and everything. It was midnight. I said, okay, may I please use the ladies' room? Where, where is it? And everybody looked at me and said, ladies, we don't have ladies here. So we don't know where's the ladies' room. <laughs> and they made me go downstairs, 20 floors. I found my way during midnight, all the like lights were closed and everything. But I remember back then, there were not much ladies doing this thing. And sometimes people were thinking they would face with a male colleague instead of me. And I was seeing this disappointment when they see me in front of them, a girl, young girl, who is claiming to be installing firewalls, which is like something serious. Uh, but I believe we changed this perception a lot uh, since last five years, 10 years with those amazing ladies in the industry. So this is how I started the role. But during the time, I had developed this huge interest on cybersecurity. Uh, and I decided to start my master's in cybersecurity area. And I tried to develop my own firewall. It was an ambitious goal. And I said, OK, I will develop an IPS. It was something new. Uh, we know that today IPS is not enough to secure a network. But back then, it was like, OK, this is a new big thing. And I said, okay, I will do an artificial intelligence-based firewall. Wow, amazing, because AI was not something hype, kind of hype back in 2006. So I said, I will give it a try. What could happen? Worst case, I would fail, 
or I will extend my school. Um, and during this period, I learned a ton. I learned a lot. And back then, as you can imagine, the internet resources was not that much available to everyone. You need to search your way in the libraries and everything. And libraries, books, searching AI, when it was not that available and industry hype. So it was not really easy. But as I said, I learned a lot. Just Jen, as Jenna said, don't have any fear for failing. Um, and then I finished my project. I presented it to my university professors and they said, yeah, but you are seeing your detection rate is like 70% something. And we have some companies in the industry like Cisco who claims they are over 95%. So we cannot tell you are a successful student. And I was like, really? <laughs> it's just me versus Cisco. What are you talking about? So this was my miserable failed moment, which I don't regret. I learned a lot. I developed myself even more in cybersecurity. And at that time, I saw another ad that's changing my life. And it was a job announcement from Cisco in Ankara, where I located, and which is not very common. So I immediately applied. I haven't even checked what's the job. I said, it's Cisco. Come on. What could it be? Even if it's an office boy or something, I will just go for it. It's Cisco. I want to learn more. And I um, got this role, but the role happens to be a sales role. I was a salesperson. I was an engineer. I was a very technical engineer who is still technical by heart, but I ended up being a salesperson. I did this role for three years. I couldn't say I enjoyed every moment, and I couldn't say this was my favorite career point. Uh, so I decided to do something more technical. And I joined uh, again in Cisco, a team called Technical Services. And this Technical Services team is dealing with the biggest customers, like service providers, biggest finance customers, to help them on their post-sales issues. And I had a chance to work with all those super techie guys that you probably admire, like double CCAEs, triple CCAEs. I was meeting with a guy who was the author of the book that I was studying. And I felt really like in heaven. Okay, this is an engineering heaven for me. So I did this role many years in different positions. And during this time, I started to think about, okay, once you did a sales role, you are always a salesperson. <laughs> it started to kick me. I want to be a little bit close to business again. I want to do something touching to customers, like helping them to do more pre-sales. And then I decided to do an MBA while completing my other networking academic courses like CCMP. Even I attempted to CCA, it was another miserable failure, but I learned a lot again. So please keep trying, please keep trying. Um, and then finally, I landed to my current role, which leads me how it is going now slide. So now I am kind of in the perfect place for my desires and for my background. I'm doing sales, I'm doing technical, I'm leading a group of amazing engineers and I'm in cybersecurity. So, let me share a couple of things about these pictures with you so you can create a little bit more meaning out of it. So this picture on the left-hand side is a tweet from Jerry Elliott. She is our sales leader, uh, our executive VP. And she attended to my team meeting just to talk with my engineers, just to have a basic chat with us, just to share some stories and career advices and everything. And she even tweeted about this. And on the Right hand side, we have our CEO attending the same series with us, with my engineers. So it's it's not only about cybersecurity, it's not about my amazing engineering team, but this culture is inspiring me and keeping me fresh all the time. Like to be the people that I want to be back when I was a student, to learn from them, to drive in our careers. So this is an amazing thing. But it's not only about this culture or executives or my team, but the slides at the bottom are the pictures from our giving back activities. This is super important for Cisco. We like to give back to the communities. So on the picture where we have funny backpacks, actually they are backpacks we put together for the sick children. Um, when they are being transported to hospital, this is to keep them entertained or warm or whatever. Um, and the other one was we were packing some food for the 
companies who are in need. So I'm working in my favorite technology. I'm working with my favorite people and I can still create impact technically, non-technically. So this is how, is it, how it is going for me. And now I will show you something a little bit different. And if you are still with me, if you think this would be, or I guess we already passed this phase. I believe you are thinking at this point, okay, I also want a career in cybersecurity, but I'm not an electronics engineer. I will not try to create my own firewall. Is it still something for me? Definitely. So this is a just smaller portion of the available opportunities in cybersecurity, mostly for technical. So this is a heavy slide, I know, and you cannot read all of them, but this is just to give you an impression about what kind of roles do we have available in cybersecurity. It is not a niche for pure technical people. It's not a niche for engineering students. It's not a niche for coders or hackers with the hoodies and everything. We have a lot of different roles in cybersecurity, all kinds of roles. If you are a non-technical person, a social science person, if you are planning to do cybersecurity marketing, you can do cybersecurity sales. You can do interviews with the cybersecurity professionals, or you can do hands-on, you can develop products, you can do the coding, and you can prepare it. Or you can do like uh, Jenny is doing physical security. Or you can, if you are more focused on the details, like um, governments, institutions and everything, maybe you can do some uh, compliance issues. We have lots of positions for you. Just make your mind and think about, okay, who am I? What I enjoy doing most? What kind of role do I want for myself? And then you can find a perfect career for you. But where would you start? And in this next slide, I have something for you. I'm sure you have mobile phones. Just go and scan this. This is taking you to a quick LinkedIn article that I put together last year after um, this kind of conversation that I had with university students. I was getting lots of questions. I was getting lots of kind of repeating questions and I decided to put together a article together. And it's talking about where you can start, what kind of free courses are available for you, where to go next, what to do. And it's, it would give you enough initial information to kickstart your career. Um, and I definitely start having a pet with Netaket. If you still don't have the account, please create it. Um, we know that it is like age of internet. You have lots of materials in internet, but if you don't know where to start, in a structured way, you will struggle a lot and you will lose time a lot. And cybersecurity is a discipline that you need to be kept in track. If you go to a little bit wrong direction, you can put yourself in a bad situation or you can lose a lot of time. So institutions like Networking Academy, when you have a structured course, where it's taking you step by step, what's right, what's wrong, where to start, where to go, you will really have a kickstart and most of them are for free, just as we said at the beginning of the session. So these are my advices for you. Uh, this is how I did it and I'm really enjoying it. I'm looking forward to see you with us, either in our team, either with our customers or working together in the industry. Thank you, Rebecca. Back to you. Thank you, Berju, for sharing your story and your career journey with us today and for outlining all the possibilities in cyber. I love the fact that you, you point out that it's not just for strong technical people, that there's marketing and selling and different roles. Because I think sometimes people think, oh, to be in cyber, I have to be a math genius and I have to have a PhD and that's not the case. So thank you for sharing that with us. Your curiosity and determination are really inspiring. I think both speakers today left us with the message of never give up and keep trying. Right. So I think that's a, a persistent theme that I heard from both of our speakers, even though they look at cybersecurity from really different um, lenses. So I think now we've got a few minutes left. We're going to take some questions. And so I think I'd like to start off with a question for Jenny. Um, and it is, where do you think the role of people hacker 
will be in 10 years because you're coming at from the physical and psychological role. And Berju said cybersecurity is changing so quickly. Where do you see yourself and kind of your sort of role, you know, in the future five to 10 years out? So it's a great question. And the thing is, um, the one constant in security is the people. Um, the one vulnerability that we will never really be able to fix and that we shouldn't aspire to fix is what makes us all human beings, what makes us all vulnerable. Because in, in some ways, our vulnerability and our, our uniqueness is what makes us strong as well. So I always say, you know, I, I never even called myself a social engineer for many years. It's just the term that um, that these days, we, you know, we've come to understand and I always say now is that the first social engineer is the first time a human being wanted something from another human being and used deception to get it. We had our first social engineer. And despite how far our species has come and technology has come and the world has come, we still have social engineers now uh, and we'll still have them in the future. All that happens is uh, malicious social engineers, con artists and fraudsters will adapt their scripts and their attack vectors uh, around the narrative, we saw this in the pandemic, around the narrative that we all live through and around the technology that we have. But the fundamental things will always be the same. So where do I see myself and, and the profession in 10 years? Doing the same thing around different technology and a different macro narrative will still be there. Good point. People will always be people, right, Jenny? So <laughs> the technology may change, but we still have our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities and our vices and our greed, right? Exactly. So and it's our strength though as well. That's the that the, no tech can spot the same things that a human can can spot or will fall for the same things a human can fall for. There's too much nuance. So right. good point. Good point. Thank you for that. Um, Bergio, I'd like to turn a, a question over to you, and it's it's one that's an interesting one given our role in Networking Academy and, and trying to reach um, under-resourced or marginalized communities. Do you have any advice for people who may have physical disabilities or may be a bit older that are looking to change careers or that have some physical challenges? Is cybersecurity a suitable kind of role for them? Do you have any insight there of what you've seen in your education or at Cisco? Of course, this is a perfect role for you. Uh, this is this is in a nutshell, but let me give you a little bit more details and give you some extra understanding on this. So if you remember my previous slides, I show you a couple of possible opportunities. And in this one, for example, just an example, this, is, this shouldn't be the only case, but if you want to be a cybersecurity analyst, like, or if you are doing some malware analyst kind of role, this is something definitely you can do remotely. If you are sitting in India, if you are sitting in Sydney, and you can still do work for US, it doesn't matter. You can work remotely, you can be in front of your computer, you don't need to take care of any like physical activities or something. This is definitely the second thing. Cybersecurity is a fairly new discipline compared to other ones. So most of the people who are at these levels were doing something different. For example, let me give you an example. Um, if you heard about Cisco's Talos Cyber Threat Intel organization, the EMR leader of Talos used to be a biologue and he was dealing with human viruses. And he said, okay, this is human virus. And then I decided to switch a little bit for computer viruses. What does it mean for me? So if you think about the hacker persona or hackers can be good or bad, but let's say attacker. They are coming from all different backgrounds. They have all different varieties of motivations. So we need diversity. It doesn't matter what age you are in. It doesn't matter if you are disabled or not. It doesn't matter where you are located. Please, this would be a very fulfilling career for you. And we have place for everyone. And just another example, one of the engineers that used to work with me, he was disabled for many years. And then he decided to join the cybersecurity industry and he is over 50 and now he's rocking it. So definitely we need all different kinds of people. Thank you, Berju. That was a good reply. I'd like to ask you a follow on question, if I may. Sure. Do you need a PhD or a master's degree to get started in cyber? I know a lot of people have advanced degrees, but if I have 
if, if I'm just starting college or just getting out of high school, um, can I, is there a place for me to get started? Uh, there's a place to get started for everyone. There is place for PhDs. There are places for high school students. So definitely you don't need to have a PhD. If you have PhD, you can be more on research sites. You can be developing new products. You can be researching some new algorithms. We need them. But if you don't have PhD, you can still be practical. You can still operate the tools or like uh, hardware or software those PhDs are developing. So definitely this is not a must. If you have, you can have a different track in cybersecurity. If you don't, you can have another track. So it really matters what's your background, what you enjoy doing most, and what's your personality. So this is this is the only important thing. Thank you, Burju. It sounds like there's an on-ramp for people with um, starting skills, and then you can advance your career over time with your company. So thank you for that. Definitely. Jenny, I have a question for you. Um, how do you... You touched on this, but how do you get the message across that hacking isn't so much about complicated computerization, but more about what people are typing into their devices or phishing? How do we try to get that message out a little bit better? What would you say there? Well, I think I think it's mostly that people don't realize. I mean, it's very obvious when you tell people what it is. So you just have to keep telling people. Um, and, you know, I've never found anyone who didn't sit up when I didn't show them some of my examples because it's personal to them. So if you think about awareness training, the best awareness training um, shows people how it can directly affect them and how that they can spread that and protect other people. So really, it's it's not a difficult for me. This has never been a difficult sell. OK, people always understand, because if I go in and say, so, you know, I was I was looking at social media and I found that this is your friend and this is your favorite restaurant. And then we sent you this email all about your favorite dish. People can see immediately why that might be dangerous. And that's why I always say to, to all my clients and all my friends and everyone I come across, social engineering, the human side of it is the perfect place to start with awareness and uh, training and security awareness because everyone can it's much more easy for people to visualize um an attacker you know a, a bad person trying to manipulate you than it is to to visualize you know some a complicated piece of malware or a virus or something like that you know your normal lay people who are not in the industry can totally appreciate someone on the end of the phone trying to take your bank details and pretending to be your bank so i think my advice would be, don't think that people don't understand. People do understand. We just need to show them how it relates to them and potentially what they're doing. And then they become advocates and go and spread it. And that's what I see whenever I tell this story, whenever I give examples of what I do, they sort of nervously laugh, they get it, and then they go and spread the word. And that's what we should be aiming for. No, that's a good point. I think sometimes we just need to be made aware. I know you mentioned, and, and Burju mentioned, I, I can't tell you how many alerts I get on my phone about I want a free set of ear pods or that my AT&T bill was paid. And I think these are not real, but if I'm not reminded that they're not real, then I might click on them because I do want a new pair of ear pods, right? So I think that right. social engineering part is important. We have time for just another question or so. And I'd like to turn to Burju. Uh, Berju, you've been in the field of security for a while now, and as you and Jenny both mentioned, it's changing quite quickly. Um, Jenny mentioned about social um, media and how that's changed her, her approach and her role. How has cybersecurity changed from when you first started? I mean, what, what changes do you see taking place now that are impactful? Mm -hmm. So... Um... When I first started to interact with cybersecurity, it was 2005. And back then, a firewall, a hardware firewall was enough to protect your company. Or we used to have those antivirus softwares in our laptops or even not laptops, the desktops. So this was more than enough for us. But now we need to have a firewall. We need to secure our endpoints. We need to secure our mobile phones, your watch, everything, our data, our Kind of in the clouds, we are using Amazon, Azure, all sorts of things. We are using SaaS software, software as a service. It's all around the place. 
we have new, of course, with these developments, we have new regulations like for the participants joining from European Union, GDPR is the big thing. So the more digitization happens, the more cloud transition happens, the more variety of products or services or extra cybersecurity we need. So it may be sometimes a little bit overwhelming to keep up with them. And it's also a little bit hard for the cybersecurity professionals to manage all of them, correlate all of them. I'm hearing something from my firewall, another thing from my cloud vendor, another thing from here and there. So this is the biggest change. Just we just don't have one single entry point at this one at this time. So and if you ask me an advice, um, I know it may be overwhelming, but think about if you are working in cybersecurity in a company defending a network or something, think about the vendors who has kind of some uniting the solutions for you to ease your life a little bit. So I, I can make a little bit ad of Cisco here. We, we are one of those vendors, uh, but I'm not talking only about Cisco here. So this is the trend change. Back then, we were okay only to prevent the IPs, lock everything, we were done. Now, no, this is, this is not possible. We need to be more active. We need to deal with all those changing dynamics. So these days it's a little bit harder to keep up. Thank you, Berju. I, it, I just think of the smart home and the smart car and all the devices that are out there that you know, that whole attack vector has just become bigger and bigger than it ever used yeah, to be. Yeah, even those robot cleaners, uh, it's it's very common these yeah. days, like walking around, they have cameras to find their ways, but you know, it's also hacked back then. Uh, if you don't update the software of those house cleaning machines, I also have one, mm -hmm. I keep it <laughs> up to date. So keep everything up to date. Don't, don't be lazy. Don't expect, your, room, like don't expect your Roomba to be an attack vector in your house, do you? So that's interesting. Yeah. Don't be well, lazy. I, I will use it, Jenny. <laughs> we're almost out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank both of our speakers. You are just, you are amazing, inspiring, passionate, and have shown, I think, so many different ways that people could get started in cybersecurity. So I'd like to thank you sincerely both for your time and for sharing your wisdom with us today. Um, for the audience out there, if you'd like to explore more on the topic of cybersecurity, I think they've both given you really cool insights into how, where this could go. We have quizzes to test your knowledge and some interesting reading material. So please visit our cybersecurity campaign page to learn more. We've played, we're going to place a link in the chat window, or you can scan a QR code on the screen that I hope is up there. Um, yep, there it is. All presentations and recordings will be made available after the session. The link to our website is in the chat. And as a reminder, being part of our live audience today entitles you to free enrollment in six of our Networking Academy courses. And as you heard from Berju, this is part of how she got her start into Cisco, is taking some Network Academy courses. Um, details relating to the enrollment are on the screen or use the link we've placed in the chat window. Folks, your feedback is really important to us. We try to tailor these webinars to meet your needs and what people are interested in. So please take a few seconds to complete the survey to receive a certificate of participation. Please scan the QR code on the screen to access the survey. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, and we look forward to having you join us on our next Women Rock IT event, where we will meet more amazing women who innovate in technology, think like entrepreneurs, and act as social change agents. Please visit our website for details. Thank you so much for joining us today, and enjoy the rest of your day wherever you may be, and stay well. Bye now.